Um, picking up with Beowulf speaking again, about line 2729. Beowulf tells us, I should wish to give my war gear to my son if there had been such. Flesh of my flesh, if fate had granted me any heir. I held this people fifty winters. There was no folk king, not any of the neighboring tribes, who dared to face me with hostile forces or threaten fear. So for fifty years there has been peace. So what kind of experience in warfare do his men have? None. None. I mean, they might do, you know, war games, practice, not quite the same as live ammunition, so to speak. Right? The decrees of fate... I awaited on earth, held well what was mine. Okay. Held well what was mine. Notice he doesn't say, I tried to get more. I sought no intrigues, nor swore many false or wrongful oaths. That nor swore many false or wrongful oaths? Lightities. How many did he swear? None. That's the point. Okay. The poet is really making. For all that, that is because of everything I have just said, I may have joy, though sick with mortal wounds. Why? Because the ruler of men need not reproach me with the murder of kinsmen when my life quits my body. Unlike Hathkin, who killed his brother, unlike Unferth, who killed his brother. Okay, and keep in mind, you, you look at these family trees and everything, and what tends to happen? Kind of like if you're familiar with the Harry Potter stories. What happens to the purebloods in Harry Potter? They out. What else, though? The, the evil is killed out. There's more tolerance. They, they all marry each other. They're, I mean, one way or another, you know, you're going to find out you got a long lost cousin over here. Right? So, killing of kin. Kind of gets to be pretty important. And Beowulf says, I didn't. Now go quickly. Look at the hoard under the hoary stone, dear Wheelof, now that the worm lies dead. Hurry, so that I might witness that ancient wealth, those golden goods, might eagerly gaze on the bright, gem, bright precious gems. Why? To ease my passing into the other world. In other words, seeing that I got a bunch of sparklies for my people will make it easier for me to die. Okay, so Weston, the son of Weston, goes. And he goes into the barrow, and we're told he sees bright jewels, glittering gold, wonders on the walls, flagons standing, ancient serving vessels without a steward, trappings all moldering. There's a helmet, old and rusty, armbands, twisted ornaments. And then the poet gives us this nice little gnomic passage. Treasure may easily, gold in the ground, give the slip to any one of us. Let him hide it who will. And then look at your footnote. Or, another way to translate it, treasure can get the better of any man. Heed these words who will. Now, when I teach my graduate course in Beowulf, and we're going over this passage, that's usually closer to how I translate the poem than the translation given here. The translation given here is from Mitchell and Robinson. Okay, And again, they are directing you. Gold or treasure can get the better of any man. Heed these words who will. What does that imply? Okay, what does that mean, though? How can it get the best of someone? We were just talking about how it causes the fears. Yes. Or, the desire for gold ends up where? What does it ultimately get you? Six feet in the ground. I mean, what good does the gold do to that ancient race of people that the last survivor puts in the tomb? None. 
It doesn't do them any good ultimately. Okay? Likewise, we love sees an ensign all golden hanging over the horde. He sees light gleaming from it. It's like the dragon even has candles in his cave. Kind of domestic dragon, I don't know. <laughs> no sign of the serpent there. And then we're told the horde and that barrel was looted. The ancient work of giants by one man alone. He piled in his arms cups and plates, whatever he wants. He doesn't loot like the thief loots, you know, one little cup. He goes in there, he gets an armful to take out and drop in front of Beowulf. He wants to show Beowulf as much different kind of treasure as he can. And we're told, he runs out, burdened with treasures, wondering whether Beowulf was still alive. And then with the treasures, he found the famous prince, line 2788, his own lord, his life at an end, all bloody. He began once more to sprinkle him, until the point of a word escaped from his breast. Old, full of grief, he looks on the gold. For all these treasures, I offer thanks with these words to the eternal Lord, King of glory. No weird here. Okay. For what I gaze upon here. Why? That, meaning because, I was able to acquire such wealth for my people before my death day. Why does Beowulf want to acquire the gold? Not for himself. Huge difference. Beowulf wants to acquire the wealth to benefit his people, the people of the gates. Keep in mind, what is another word for king? Gold giver, gold friend, gold dispenser. Okay? That's what Beowulf wants to do. He doesn't want to be like Haramod and say, mine and hoard it all himself. I mean, we even use the word, hoard it, okay? Treasure is supposed to be what? Given away. That's how it becomes valuable. That's how it becomes useful. Only when it is given away. Treasure that is hoarded, buried in the ground, always, okay, becomes tainted in one shape or form. Now that I've sold my old lifespan for this hoard of treasures, they will attend to the needs of the people. He says, now the Gatish people will no longer suffer. This treasure will be used for their good, for their benefit. This is what Beowulf thinks. Okay? Because what do we know from reading at the end of the poem? No, it won't. What is the good that comes with the treasure? Nothing. What do they do with it? They put it all on top of Beowulf when they get ready to burn him on the funeral pyre. So they burn Beowulf with all of this treasure on top of him. So the gold and the silver melt together. The gemstones crack. And then what do they do with it? They stick it in the ground. It doesn't do them one lick of good. The brave in battle will build the tomb, be built shining over my pyre on the cliffs by the sea. It will be as a monument to my people and tower high on Whale's Head. And it will be called Beowulf's Barrow, he says. And he takes from his neck a golden circlet. This is a torque, a ring, T-O-R-C, okay? A big neck ring. He pulls it off and he gives it to Wheelof. What is he doing? <clears throat> Passing down the position of king, basically. Conferring kingship on him. <clears throat> okay? And he tells uh, Wheelof, You are the last survivor of our lineage, the Waymundings. Fate has swept away all of my kinsmen, earls in their courage, to their final destiny. I must follow them. Now, for those of you who have read some American literature, 19th century, that might remind you of a passage. Anybody know what I'm thinking about? Great film. 
done in about 1990, no, geez, earlier than that, 1988, 89, with Daniel Day-Lewis as the hero. Last of the Mohicans. That is almost the exact language that Chingachgook says when Uncas dies. He says, I am the last of the Mohicans. And he says, and when I go, I will go off to where my kinsmen have gone. Okay? In, there's, there's a unique thread that runs throughout all of English literature of this idea of the last survivor. We saw it in here already, the lay of the last survivor. You've got the wanderer. Okay? The dream of the rude is about a guy who's also a last survivor. And it goes all the way up through, you know, not only that passage in Last Mohicans, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Okay? Um, Melville, big long novel that I've never finished. Moby Dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get to the section on, on cetology on whales and it's like, my eyes glass over and I'm like, really? I mean, really? Other than a professor I had when I was an undergraduate who was, for lack of a better word, a Moby Dickaholic. I mean, she was really weird. I mean, she had cartoons plastered all over, and they're all Moby Dick cartoons in like things like the New Yorker and the Atlantic. Just, it's like, why? I mean, maybe you like Moby Dick. <clears throat> okay, that was the last word of the old warrior. From his breast flew his soul to seek the judgment of the righteous. Okay, literally, we're told the dome or fame of the truth fast. An ambiguous pronouncement. It's not ambiguous. It's ambiguous if you want to try to sanitize, let's say, the poem a little bit. It is not clear whether this means that Beowulf's soul received the sort of judgment that a righteous soul ought to receive and so go to heaven, or that it will be judged by those fast in truth and so go to hell as an unbaptized pagan. Mm. Bull doo doo. <laughs> I mean, that is just nonsense. Okay? Back up a little bit. That was the last word of the old warrior, his final thought before he chose the fire, the hot surging flames from his breast flew his soul to seek the judgment of the righteous. I don't have Beowulf pulled up on my computer because I would read it to you in the Old English. And what happens to Wheelough at this point? He's overcome with sorrow. The young warrior had to watch his most precious lord fare so pitifully his life at an end. He sees the serpent. He could no longer rule his horde of wings, uh, rings. No more soaring about in the skies. Okay. And then we're told 2846, 45B. It was not long before the men late for battle. How late were they for battle? <laughs> Another little example of Lytotes. Okay. They left the woods, 10 of those weak traitors altogether. Wait, why only 10? There were 13 of them altogether. Beowulf and 12 others. Mm -hmm. no. And what did he do? He wasn't commanded to stick around. No. He, he's go long gone. Okay. Ten of those weak traitors all together. And Wheelof sits and notice, exhausted, a foot soldier at his lord's shoulder tried to rouse him with water. This is the third time. Twice when he washes Beowulf with water, he's still alive. Now, he ain't coming back. You know, Mad Max isn't there with his magic pill to um, see if he's mostly dead. He could not, no matter how much he wanted, keep the life in the body of his captain, <clears throat> nor change any bit of the ruler's decree. The judgment of God would guide the deeds of every man Notice this is back then, as it still does today. What's the poet suggesting? Ultimately, God is in control. Ultimately, 
<clears throat> God will guide the deeds of every man. Does that mean we have no choice? That God says, hmm, giant chess game. I'm going to put you here. You're a pawn. You're expendable. You know, off to hell with you. You know. <laughs> no. Guide how? Well, if you read Boethius, you got this notion that I put on the board last week of synergy. God, seeing all of human history as the from the perspective or standpoint of now, the eternal present, all time, because he's outside of time, whereas we, unfortunately, get to see it plodding along moment by moment, never knowing what the next moment's going to bring. Then it was easy to get a grim answer from that youth to those who gave up courage. And, and wheel off, let's rip. He can say, oh yes, who would speak the truth, that the liege lord who gave you those gifts of treasures, the military gear, gear you stand in there, when on the ale benches he often handed out helmets and burnies to the hall sitters, that all that battle dress he absolutely and entirely threw away. In other words, you guys boasted when. When they're sitting there throwing back shots, okay? When they're sitting there drunk, they boasted, yeah, Beowulf, we'll be with you to the other end, you know? We'll fight whatever months. And Beowulf's here. Have a nice helmet, have a nice war burning, have a nice sword. And then when it comes to it, they skedaddle. Our nation's king had no need to boast of his comrades in arms, but the ruler of victories, God, allowed that he, along with his blade, might avenge himself when he needed your valor. Notice what Wheelof does not do. He doesn't take any credit. Doesn't take any credit. He says, Beowulf did it on his own. Only a little life protection could I offer him in battle, but began nevertheless to support my kinsmen beyond my own strength. He said, all I did was I struck the, the serpent with my sword and a fire less severe surging from his head. I helped put out the flame. Two few supporters thronged around our prince in his great peril. In other words, if you guys had been there with me, Beowulf might still be alive. Now the getting of treasure, the getting of swords, all the happy joys of your homeland shall end for your race. What does he mean for your race? Are they different somehow? For you. Exactly. You, your families, your children, your children's children, what are they all going to become? <laughs> kind of. Okay. What are they really going to become? exiles. They will become wretched in the real meaning of the word. He says, empty-handed will you go every man among your tribe, deprived of his land rights. In other words, we're going to take your land from you when no woman learned far and wide of your flight, your inglorious deed. Death is better for any earl than a life of dishonor. Right? So he announces what happened here needs to be announced to the camp. Well, what's the camp? The clamp, uh, camp is the people up by the cliff's edge. The troop of Earl Shield Bearers sat sad-minded sad all the long morning wondering what happens. So Beowulf takes himself and 12 other men to go off and fight the dragon. Are they the only ones who leave the land of the gates? No. It's like you have a much larger group, and they go off, and they go off to the headland, and then Beowulf and a smaller group go off. Sound like anybody else? Jesus? You're very good. Okay. <laughs> Jesus has the 70 disciples, uh -huh. and in that group, he then has a smaller group of 12 wow. disciples, and then he has an even smaller group of three, Peter, James, and John, right. and then he has an even smaller group, John. John. Only one faithful at the crucifixion. Kind of like Wheelof, right? 
Not saying Jesus is Beowulf. Don't get that. <laughs> don't make that mistake. I've had people say, oh, Dr. Sherman says Beowulf is really Jesus. <laughs> no, he's not. He's not at all. Okay. So, Wheelof sends word, and this is the word he sends, apparently. Now is the joy giver of the Gatish people, the Lord of the Waiters, laid on his deathbed, holding a place of slaughter by the serpent's deed. Behind, beside him lies his life enemy. Okay, so Beowulf's dead and the dragon's dead. So, you know, they kind of mix the good with the bad. The bad is Beowulf's dead. The good is we don't have to worry about a dragon torching us anymore. Wheelof sits, Waystan's offspring, over Beowulf. He holds with desperate heart the watch over friend and foe. And then we don't know whether Wheelof tells the messenger to say everything that follows, or if the messenger just kind of starts playing, you know, Robin Williams and ad-libs all this. <laughs> now this folk may expect a time of trouble. When this is manifest to the Franks and Frisians, and the fall of our king becomes widespread news. The strife was begun hard with the Hugas, and again we get Helak's Frisian raid. After Helak came traveling with the ships to the shores of Frisia, where the Hetwer attacked him in war, advanced with valor, etc. Okay, ever after that, the Merovingians have not shown mercy to us. So, if you had that map, He's saying the Frisians, the Franks, the Hetware, the Merovingians, they all want a piece of us. And word is finally going to spread out. Beowulf's dead. And what's everybody going to say? We want a piece. I mean, Beowulf's dead. We don't have to worry about anything. Okay? Nor do I expect any peace or truce from the Swedes. So we have the Frisians, the Hetware, the Franks. Uh, the Merovingians down to the southwest. We have the Swedes up to the northeast. Where are we? Mm -hmm. Right in the middle. Yep. We are literally kind of sitting on the top of the anvil and we are about to get smacked. It has been well known that Anyanthal ended the life of Hathkin, son of Hrethel, in Ravenswood. When in their arrogant pride, the Gatish people first sought out the battle showings. Notice what caused them to start a feud? Their arrogant pride. Immediately, the ancient father of Otra, old and terrifying, he returned the attack. And what happened? The old warrior cut down the sea captain, this is Hathkin, rescued his wife, bereft of her gold. You know, could be a little ambiguous there what that really means. Onala's mother and Ultra's. Did Hathkin rape her? Or did he just take her physical, real treasure? Okay. Then we get a whole bunch of stuff going on there. They hear, they hear he elects horn and trumpet. He comes to the rescue, Fit 41. The bloody swath of the seed, Swedes and gates, the slaughter of men, was easily seen. That good man, Onyanthal, then departed. It means he got killed. Okay. We're going to skip a bunch again. And Helak essentially wins the battle. Uh, I want to skip a whole bunch down there and go to... Line 29.99. Okay. The previous lines, Helak gives his daughter in, ba in battle, gives his daughter in marriage to Eover because Eover killed Onyanthiao. And in 2999, that is the feud and the fierce enmity, savage hatred among men that I expect now when the Swedish people seek us out. So it's not only that Wilof is now king and Eodils is now king, it's also, there's an old standing, you know, huge feud between the Swedes and the Gates. After they have learned that our Lord has perished, who had once protected his hoarding kingdom against all hostility, after the fall of heroes, the valiant shieldings, worked for the people's good, and what is more, performed noble deeds. Now we must hurry. Why do they have to hurry? The They're gonna yeah, the implication is we need to get Beowulf burned and buried so we can run. 
no small part part of the hoard shall burn with that brave man. But countless gold treasures, grimly purchased in rings, here at at last with his own life paid for, then the flame shall devour the fire and fold. So the messenger says, Beowulf will be burned with all of the treasure. But he said, I bought this treasure for the good of the people. We don't know yet what is going on with the treasure. Let no warrior wear treasures for remembrance, nor no fair maiden have a ring ornament around her neck. But sad in mind, stripped of gold, she must walk a foreign path, not once, but often. Now that leader of our troop has laid aside laughter. Why is she going to have to walk a foreign path? Why will the warrior not have a ring ornament or wear treasures for remembrance? The speaker is suggesting something's going to happen to him. The warriors are going to die. And the women are going to become slaves. Okay. So they won't get nice finery and ornament. Thus many a cold morning shall the spear be grasped in frozen fingers, hefted by ants. Nor shall the sound of the harp rouse the warriors. But the dark raven, greedy for carrion, shall speak a great deal. Ask the eagle how he fared at his feast when he plundered corpses with the wolf. There you have the classic image of the three beasts of battle. You've got the raven, the eagle, and the wolf doing what? Plundering the corpses, eating the dead. Okay, The hands that hold the spear in frozen fingers, the fingers will be forever frozen. We're talking about bodies lying on the fields okay, in rigor mortis. Thus that brave speaker was speaking a most unlovely truth. Okay. So the warriors go and they find Beowulf. They find the dragon. And the dragon gets described. Here he's described as 50 feet long. Okay. The text, if I remember correctly, it's 50 paces long, and they take the dragon and do what with him? Push him in the ocean. Okay. And then we're told they go into the cave. Cups and vessels. They see beside Beowulf. Plates lay there and precious swords eaten through with rust as if in the bosom of the earth they had lain for a thousand winters. All that inheritance... Now this is something Wheelof doesn't know. This is something Beowulf didn't know. All that inheritance was deeply enchanted. The gold of the ancients was gripped in a spell, so that no man in the world would be able to touch that ring hall unless God himself, the true king of victories, protector of men, granted to whomever he wished to open the hoard, to whatever person seemed proper to him. Okay. Now you've got a little gloss there. The power of the pagan spell can be overruled by the will of the true God. Or it can be read that the power of the spell is no one can touch this hoard unless God himself allows you. So then the $100,000 question becomes, did God allow Beowulf to? Which then presupposes another question. Why did Beowulf want to touch the treasure? For himself, which would be the sin of greed or avarice, not good, or was it for others? Then it was plain that the journey did not profit the one who had wrongfully hidden under a wall that great treasure. Okay. Um, so it was with Beowulf when he sought the barrow's guarding in a hostile fight. Even he did not know how his parting from life should come to pass, since until doomsday mighty princes had deeply pronounced, when they placed it there, that is, when they placed the treasure there, they had pronounced that the man who plundered that place would be harried by hostile demons, 
fast, that is, held firm in hellish bonds, grievously tortured, guilty of sins, unless the owner's grace had earlier more readily favored the one eager for gold. The old English text is corrupt, and the precise meaning of this passage is not certain. In other words, do with it what you want. Not quite. I mean, yes, there are some problems in the passage, but it seems to me it's still somewhat clear. The poet is telling us, this treasure is really cursed, and that anybody who touches it will be harried by hostile demons, will suffer in hell, will be tortured, unless the owner of the treasure, who is God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the psalmist says. Everything is God's. Unless the owner had favored someone to find it. Okay? And so Wheelof speaks. People have now come up. The, those who had been sitting on the camp, they now come. And Wheelof speaks to a larger group. Often many earls must suffer misery through the will of one man, as we have now seen. Does that sound like anything? If you're familiar, familiar with the New Testament? Just as in one all have died, St. Paul writes, so in one shall all be made alive. This doesn't include the second part. Okay? It only includes the first. Many earls must suffer through the will of one man. The thief, many people suffered because of the thief. We could not persuade our dear prince, shepherd of a kingdom with any counsel, that he should not greet that gold guardian. Let him lie there where he long had been, inhabit the dwellings until the end of the world. Now, in my reading of that, there's only one way you can read it. He is being critical of Beowulf. When I proposed that idea about three years ago on Ansax, Again, I mean, flamethrowers coming through my computer. People are like, oh, well, he would never be, you know, critical of his Lord who had just died. That's ludicrous. That's ridiculous. Explain it then. We could not persuade our dear prince that he should not greet that gold guardian. Let him lie where he long had been. What has the dragon done? After he torches the countryside, he goes back, he makes a little pillow, he puts his head down, and it appears he will be asleep for another 300 years. And Beowulf goes, wake up! Who? Beowulf. What do you mean? The dragon's killed the best. The dragon's killed a lot of his people. He is gone after most of his clan, taken out most of his land. If he doesn't, isn't that kind of like saying, it's fine, y'all don't matter, you're not family, you're not kin, I don't have to avenge you. Basically, you know, take your vomits and get out. That's, that's essentially the argument that people put forth, that Beowulf was constrained to. But what does Wheelof say? Or what does Wheelof suggest? Couldn't he be saying that they were, saying, they were being, like, selfish trying to keep him and he was being the honorable one? I don't know, let's look at the rest of what he says. Inhabit the dwellings until the end of the world, colon. Colon's not in the original, by the way. He held to his high destiny. What is Beowulf's high destiny? Was it the destiny he held as king? What is the job of the king? Ideally. <laughs> to protect his people. Okay. This brings up the issue of what makes a good king. Does a good king go off and fight in battle by himself? That's kind of idiotic. What does a good king do? Or a good president? You go fight. Okay, you got killed? Sorry. You go fight. You go. A good king has generals, admirals, okay, and delegates. Because what happens if the king dies? Chaos. Chaos ensues. Right? Okay. The horde is opened. Grimly gotten, that fate was too great which impelled the king of our people thither. Okay. 
We could not persuade our dear prince that he should not greet that gold guardian. What does that really mean? We tried. We tried. He said no. He woke the dragon up. The dragon's dead. Beowulf's dead. I was in there, he says, in the hall, the cave. Looked over at all the hall's ornaments when a way was open to me. By no means gently was a journey allowed in under that earth wall. He says, I seized a mighty burden of treasure. I bore it out. Beowulf is still alive then. He was conscious. He spoke of many things. He wants a barrel built. He wants a pyre. So let us now make haste for one more time to see and seek out the store of cunning gems, the wonder under the wall. I will direct you. So what do people do? Everybody goes in and they touch this hoard. The only problem is what's on the hoard? A curse. So everybody touches it and it's like it's contagious. Was it only Beowulf that is allowed to touch it? Or was it only Wheelof? Don't know. Then the son of Weston, let it be known to many heroes, households, that they should bring him from a far wood. <clears throat> and he summoned from that house some of the best of the king's thanes, seven. And what do they do? They ride around the burial mound. And we're told they push the dragon off into the water. And 43. Um... Just the beginning of the fit. The people of the gates prepared, then prepared for him a splendid pyre upon the earth, hung with battle shields, helmets, bright burnies as he had been. Not their own. All the stuff they bring out from the burial mound. There in the middle they lay the mighty prince, the heroes lamenting their dead lord. The warriors then kindled there on the cliff the greatest of funeral pyres. Dark over the flames the wood smoke rose, the roaring fire mingled with weeping the wind lay still until it had broken that bone house hot at the heart. What does that mean? <laughs> Beowulf pops, so to speak. Ew, I know. <clears throat> With heavy spirit, they mourned their despair, the death of their lord. Some Gaitish woman sang a sorrowful song. One famous Beowulf scholar in the mid-20th century, in the 1960s, a guy named Westphalen, suggested that she's actually Beowulf's wife, though there's nothing that indicates in the poem that Beowulf was ever married. Okay? She sings a song, and notice, her song goes up with the smoke. Heaven swallowed the smoke. What's that an image of? If you've ever been to a Catholic or Orthodox church, what is used in them? Incense. Incense. It's an image of incense rising. Okay. Then they build a big barrow. It takes them 10 days. Okay. They take the ashes and they close them with a wall. And in the barrow they placed rings and bright jewels and all the trappings that those reckless men had seized from the hoard before. Notice, those reckless men. What does reckless mean? Um, no. You familiar with uh, George Manley Hopkins? It's not Pipe Beauty. It's one of his other. Um, World is charged with grandeur. That has the line Men do not wreck his rod. Talking about God. Okay. What's this word mean? It's the same word from which we get reckon, consider, think, reckless, thoughtless, not thinking. These thoughtless men had seized from the hoard before. Let the earth hold the treasures of earls, gold and the ground where it yet remains just as useless to men as it was before. And it seems to me, in one sense, you could say that kind of sums up Beowulf. Don't put your faith, don't put your trust, don't put your hope 
in stuff. Because what happens to it? How many of you have had cell phones die on you? Or these things die on you? Night before papers do. Your hard drive, you know. Or your cat pees on your computer. I believe me, I've heard everything. My son barfed on the computer. You know. Kid actually did that once, opened it, and I was like, oh, man. Because it really stunk. Okay? <laughs> Let the earth hold the treasures of earls, gold in the ground, where it yet remains, just as useless to men as it was before. Before when? Okay, that could be one reading of it. As useless as it was when it was originally in the ground, placed by the owner, let's say, or... Before God allowed it to be uncovered, basically. Okay. The people who owned it, the people who put the arm rings on, you know, you see the guys walking down the street, right? Bunch of chains all over their necks and pierced every which way. What good does it do you? Is the point. Then round the mound rode the brave battle men, twelve in all, and they sing. And they sing utter sad songs and speak of that man. They praise his lordship, his proud deeds. They judge well his prowess. And then we're told, line 3180 and following, they said that he was of all the kings of the world, the mildest of men. Beowulf? Mild? He squeezed a guy to death for Pete's sake, okay? And the most gentle, like he's just a really just a big, soft, cuddly teddy bear, okay, who squeezes you to death. <laughs> Not the kind of teddy bear you want to have in your bed, you know. <laughs> The kindest to his folk and the most eager for fame. Now, people who read this poem allegorically or read it from a Christian perspective, they'll take those last few lines, last few words, most eager for fame, a lot of them do, and they say, see, Beowulf got what he deserved. He wanted glory here on earth. He's burning and rotting in hell. Most eager for fame in a Germanic society that's a good thing. Beowulf's in a Germanic society. If he wasn't eager for fame, you would think there's something wrong with him. Okay? Uh, question? Oh, I just had a different translation. It says for honor. Honor. Um, others will, will say glory. The old, the old English word there is lof ye or nost. Okay? This is what means most eager. The ost is, is superlative. Most eager, lof. This is usually translated either glory or fame. Okay? But notice what else. Mild, gentle, kind. Now it seems to me Beowulf doesn't himself doesn't follow the Germanic fourfold ethic. Okay? He doesn't embody it. He doesn't even necessarily completely follow the heroic ethic for a couple of reasons. When he tells us about how he lived his life after he's been attacked by the dragon and he's dying, in other words, he's not going to lie because he knows he's getting ready to meet, meet his maker, so to speak. He tells us how he lived and how he ruled. Fifty years of peace. Have we seen anybody else with fifty years of peace? Did Grindel's mother rule for fifty years of peace? No, her son's going off eating people. Okay, Hrothgar? No, no. because Grindel showed up. And what kind of peace did Hrothgar have? Everyone was so afraid of him, they gave him everything he wanted, etc. What else did Beowulf do? He told us earlier. He never slew his hearth companions. It's important that he tells us that because he's drawing a distinction between himself and others. The implication is this happens in Germanic society. And we know it happened because a first century Roman by the name of Tacitus wrote in his book Germania to, and described the Germanic people. And he talks about the warriors. Okay, and this is like 500 years before Beowulf, roughly. He writes this in about 97 AD. 
Um, he talks about how the Germanic warriors would sit around in their hall and just get completely wasted and how they're all fully armed. And somebody says something and the next thing you know, you have half as many troops because they're hauling out the dead guys. Okay? That's what Beowulf says, I didn't do. What else didn't he do? He never entered into any false oaths. The very fact that he mentions that to us tells us it's important. Tells us that's not the norm. So is the norm to enter into a pact and yet be secretly planning to violate it? Okay, you could say the English do it all the time. We have a pretty good example in the 20th century of a German doing that. Uh, yeah. Hitler, yeah. Munich Pact. Mm -hmm. Hitler, uh, the Anschluss. Yeah. The, you know, when Hitler took over the Czechoslovakia and the Sudetenland and Austria, there you have a German, <laughs> and he's being German, <laughs> for lack of a better phrase. Beowulf doesn't do any of that. Why not? Because he's not a good German? Because he's not a good pagan? Because he's secretly a closet Christian pagan? No. He doesn't know anything about Christ. Yet what I think the poet is doing, and the poet, keep in mind, is different from the time in which the poem is set. The poet is, almost everybody says, is a Christian. And the poet is probably writing or composing, at least if it's orally composed, for a Christian audience. You can modify Christian. You can have, you know, real staunch Christians. Or you can have, yeah, we've been baptized, but, you know, we're going to hedge our bets and we're going to pray to the gods, too. Okay? Most people think that Beowulf was probably sung at or composed in, or many people believe this, a monastery. So what kind of audience? Thoroughly Christian. Okay, Maybe not all that literate. A lot of monks were completely, totally illiterate. They still knew the prayers, they could do the prayers, and work in the days, and you know, all that kind of stuff. But if Beowulf is composed for a Christian audience, and you have this character who doesn't fit in the Anglo-Scandinavian tradition, let's say, or the Scandinavian, the Danish tradition. He stands out. Why might the poet be doing that? Exactly. Both of you. Beowulf might show a third way. That is, one way of living would be the pagan Germanic way. Where do we see that? Schild Shevin, Hrothgar, <clears throat> Onyanthal, Hrevel, Hafkin, Helek. What does that get you? Six feet of ground. <laughs> it doesn't do you any good, right? I mean, you have the lay of the last survivor. That's them. Okay. Another way that they're unaware of in the poem is the Christian way. Right? Love your neighbors, do good unto those who wish you harm, turn the other cheek, you know. Yeah, as you're getting ready to do, you know, a full turnaround and lop the guy's head off. They they don't know this at all. So let me let me do it this way. Let's say there's a progression. And say so you begin here and you're moving to here. I think Beowulf is in here. Beowulf is showing the movement from the pagan Germanic system, let's say of belief or of action or of ethical behavior to the Christian, but he's not there yet. Why? Because he doesn't say on his deathbed, Lord Jesus Christ, come into my heart, accept my spirit, I'm yours. <laughs> but he does the best with what he knows. 
In other words, Beowulf is, and I'm stealing a lot of this from J.R. Tolkien, is the noble, honest pagan, or the noble, good pagan, right? And the Christian poet is looking back to a, po a period in history, a real time period, and he's saying, you know, not everything is bad back here. We don't have to destroy it all. We don't have to burn it all. We don't have to say, oh, our ancestors were heathens and damned to hell. We can say, you know, there are some people who tried their best. Kind of following what St. Paul says in Romans. Anybody know what I'm getting at? Well, Paul talks about the law of God written on their hearts. In other words, he says, before the law came, people did what they did because it was in here. And even St. Paul says, there are some people who don't know anything about Christianity, don't know anything about God, per se, and how will they be judged? According to what they do know. Like Beowulf. Like Croft. They haven't had anything else. That's why you then, if you go back to that line 175 to 185, and we hear the poet say, you know, they reverted to their old dirty, rotten, heathen, paganish ways, and they sacrificed to the slayer of souls. That's a Christian poet hearkening back and says, you know, not everything was good. They did have some, you know, sorry things. That's why, you know, Seems like about once every 10 years, something happens up in Scandinavia and they find a new bog person. They dig some guy up, they find him in a bog, he's got a noose around his neck, and usually a big old wound in the side of his head, or his throat is slit, and he has a noose around his neck. Go to the British Museum and you can see the most famous one of all. It's a guy curled up, and he's got a noose, and his throat slit. He was a human offering, a human sacrifice thrown into a pit. Okay. The Germans did this, the Saxons did this early, the Celts did it, etc. So where does Beowulf the poem figure in? I was asked, is it Christian? No. It's not Christian. Is it pagan? No. Let me rephrase those again. Is it Christian? Yes. Is it pagan? Yes. It's in the middle. It is showing this transition from a pagan, preliterate, oral society, probably, to a Christian, literate society. Right? And Beowulf is the exemplar of good behavior. He doesn't go off and start fights. How different is that from all the other kings? I mean, shield shiving deprives his neighbors of their mead benches. It means he kills them. Helak launches an offensive action against the Frisians. And what happens as a result? He dies because of it. Okay? Hefkin launches an offensive action against Anyatyal. And what happens as a result? He dies because of it. Okay? Onala launches an attack against Hardrick. He doesn't die initially, but he does die because of it. Beowulf's the only one kind of sitting back and going, hey man, I'm not stupid. I wouldn't let you guys kill each other. He doesn't get involved in the feuds except for one sense, really. What feuds does Beowulf start? Grindle? Grindle's mother, because she's reciprocating, so now he has to up it, and the dragon. Does he have anything to do against Grindel? No. He starts that. Okay. Grindel's mother attacks. He takes out her out. What about the dragon? Well, the dragon starts against him, you could say. But what are these things? Impersonal forces? Chaos? The world kind of as it is? Fate? Weird? I mean, 
gotta admit, Grendel's pretty weird-ish. <laughs> he just shows up one morning, and Hrothgar's like, damn. <laughs> and everything was going so well, you know, and men start getting eaten. <laughs> That's about as weird as you can get. What will be, will be. It's kind of like September 11th, 2001. Mm. Only difference is, what does Hrothgar do? <laughs> and Beowulf says, no, you have to combat, what else are they all? Evil. They are evil. Why is the dragon evil? What does the dragon do that, that is evil? Is the dragon, as a lot of Christian allegorical readers suggest, is the dragon symbolic of Satan? Is he the great Satan from the book of... No, he's not. Maybe, yeah, I was about to say exactly. He is a typical northern Germanic dragon. He's a greedy SOB. All he wants is his treasure. Just leave me alone. Pure and simple. He's... Yes. Which therefore makes it not a sin. Well, you could say, that, I mean, that's that's one argument, but their argument, the argument of the Middle Ages would be mm -hmm. dragons are twisted. That is, dragons aren't the way they were originally meant to be. Why? Because of the fall of Adam and Eve. Oh, so they which like which is like which is like a you know a drop in a pond. The fall of Adam and Eve doesn't just affect us. Yeah. It affects the whole world. So, in kind of an agreement. Which you were just saying. Um, does one quality of something make it evil, especially if that quality is innate? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> let's say somebody's let's say somebody's quality happens to be murderous. <laughs> is that in a I mean Well he'd just taken the cup back. He didn't have to, you know, kill everybody. But he wouldn't give the cup back. He ran away. Well, yeah. He still yeah. that one dude. And he couldn't find that one dude. So he's telling everybody <laughs> to get to him. Right Eventually, you're going to which, is this, which is symbolic of what kind of? I mean, if you can't strike back at the person who hurts you, uh, kick their the cat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is, what, this is Satan in Paradise Lost. How many of you read Paradise Lost? It is exactly what Satan does. Satan can't strike back at God. So what does he do? The image of God. Oh, I'm going to hit them. I'm going to screw them up, and then God's going to be all sorry. And God just sits back and goes, go ahead, try. It's all under control. It all works for his good. Okay? He's like, go ahead. And he smiles. If you've read, not read Paradise Lost, Satan's chained to the lake of fire, and he's like, I can't even get up, you know. And he's talking to Beelzebub, and God smiles, and he's like, oh. And he doesn't even realize God allowed him to do that. Okay. And this takes us all back to the Boethius stuff. So in one sense, you could say, you know, it's all like, um, any of you ever seen the TV series Saint Elsewhere? Probably most of you haven't because I think it went off the air before most of you were born. <laughs> it was a TV series in the 1980s about a hospital in Boston named Saint Eligius, who was like the patron saint of losers. Okay. <laughs> and the series goes on. It had a lot of big stars. Howie Mandel got a start there and all this kind of stuff. And then the very last episode, the, the guy who runs the hospital, the hospital administrator, all throughout the series has had an autistic son. And every now and then, you know, the son is brought into one of the storylines. Okay? And he's, he's dealing with this. Well, at the very last show, the hospital gets sold off and closed. So everybody's leaving and such. Screen goes to black. And then it comes back on. And you're in a kind of a dumpy little apartment in the 1940s, and it's Christmas time. And you hear, I think, Bing Crosby singing White Christmas on the radio. And you see this little rag rug on the, on the floor, and there's a snow globe sitting on it. And this little boy reaches down, and he picks up the snow globe, and he shakes it. And then the camera slowly zooms in to the snow globe. 
And inside the snow globe is an image of the hospital, and it says, St. Eligius. So what is that suggesting? <laughs> Not quite. The whole story was to use words from Macbeth and The Sound of the Fury by uh, Faulkner. 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 Yeah. A tale told by an idiot. The whole series is essentially what's happening in the mind of this autistic boy. Well, there are some who suggest everything that happens to us is what? What happens in the mind of God. Not the God of Christianity, but the Brahman God. That everything that we are, see, do, taste, touch, feel, see, smell, etc., it's really all an illusion. It's exactly what it is. It's exactly what it is. Matrix without the computers. Okay, you know, kind of open your brain and just dump it out for a moment. Just enjoy it. You know, just roll with it. I mean, that's how you have to watch the Matrix. Just roll with all the pop psychology and all that kind of stuff. Okay? I don't think Beowulf is that. I don't know why anybody would write anything if that's what they really thought. If everything they write is, is essentially, yeah, is essentially pointless. Okay. I guess it's what happens when you die and you just decide to. Wiles away the time of meaninglessness, so to speak. Okay. All right. Um, I was talking to a couple of you during the, the break, the exam. Um, as I said last week, there will be some identification. I don't know how much. Uh, there will be some. Short answers type stuff, and the short answer could any be could be anywhere from like a couple of words to maybe a couple of sentences. Material I put on the board will probably figure in somehow. Okay, um, so you know, take a picture. Um, and these days with smartphones, I mean, I really I, I encourage you. You know, if I fill the board, just take a picture of it, and I've had students do that a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, I said don't have your phones out, you know, be doing something weird under the table. Like um, what else? There might be true, false. Might be essay, but in this class, I don't usually go for an essay. Um, and lastly, again, I will try and send you a sample from, from another class that I've done. Problem is finding one that you might not, you know, take from me. It's, you know, it'll have to be an old class that I no longer teach. Um, next week we'll do the exam first, and whatever else we do after that, I've got to leave by about six thirty, six forty-five at the absolute latest. Um, so is Sir Gowan and Green not even going to be on it? No, Sir Gowan and Green was never going to be on. It. No, the, this exam is only over the Old English portion. Obviously, for example, you know, in the identification, most of the stuff you can't name an author to. But some you can. So if I give a passage and I say, name the author, you've got one of two. I mean, you got a 50% shot. It's either Bede or Cadman. I'm, I'm not going to have name the author and have it be anonymous. Okay. Yes? How much of the names are going to be part of the test? These are hard names. Yeah. No, I, I, under, I understand. Um, if, if, I, if I have identification kind of stuff from, from Beowulf, like I have a, you know, for, for graduate students, I do a thing sometimes where I have a paragraph with a bunch of blanks. And they've got to fill in names. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know you're not grad students. Um, sometimes when I do that, I'll have a list of names at the top. And you know, it's like, gee, I don't know, flip the coin. Is it this one? You know, um, so it might be like that. Um, 
Spelling won't count for a whole lot, especially on names, but it's got to be close. You got to have the majority of the letters pretty much in a, close to the right way. You can't have, you know, E E E A L V B R E H. Um, okay, that's all. And then we'll hopefully we'll be able to start a little bit of Sir Gown of the Green Knight next week. We'll see. And 